everyone. Anne Louise Gittleman here with yet another episode of the First Lady of Nutrition podcast. I'm an award-winning author of over 37 books on health and healing, including my latest one, RadicalLongevityBook.com. And I'm just so grateful and thankful to have all of you listening to this podcast. I want to thank my sponsors, Unikey Health Systems at UnikeyHealth.com. And I'm also grateful to our newest sponsor, C-SHealth.com, which has the most activated sulforaphane on the planet. Today, I have a very inspirational guest that I've known for over 30 years. She's Alan Camp. Am I the natural nurse? And she is a graduate of Rutgers and Cornell University and a leader in the nutraceutical industry. But most of all, she's a registered herbalist and has the best antiviral natural remedies for COVID. So today, First Lady of Nutrition happily and gratefully introduces the natural nurse, Ellen Kamai. Ellen, welcome to First Lady of Nutrition podcast, my good friend. Thank you so much for hosting me today, Anne Louise. Now, how did you get involved in herbal medicine? You are a nurse, am I correct? Trained in traditional conventional medicine. Well, okay, but I use that word traditional only to discuss those remedies that have been used for thousands of years with a very high incident of not only evidence-based help, but safety. So the word traditional means natural medicine. (laughs) Now, there are conventional therapies that are also life-saving and useful, but those we call conventional, or we can call them mainstream or modern um, or allopathic. There's lots of words, but not the word traditional. That I reserve for traditional remedies, which are herbal medicines. So aren't many of our medicines derived from herbs? Oh, almost all of them. If you were to have on your shelf, like I have on my shelf, all the Materia Medicas and manuals, medical manuals from very short time ago, let's say 1940s and even up to the 1950s when I was born, all the drugs were pretty much still herbal. It was really only with World War II that they started to migrate to pharmaceutical drugs. Before that, anything that was called a drug was an herbal extract and well-documented in such places as the Lloyd Library that still maintains all the U.S. pharmacopoeia and national formularies that were all herbal until recently. So what led you on your path to natural healing? I mean, what, now, what, why did you become so interested in the herbal methods? Yeah, that was like so often the case, isn't it, Anne Louise? A personal event Always. in someone's life. I call it enlightened self-interest. Oh, that's a good way to put it. You can use well, it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to use it right now. My, in life, my enlightened self-interest happened when I was actually young. I was teaching horseback riding. I was always very involved with animals. And in fact, I wanted to go to uh, become a veterinarian. And I did go to pre-veterinary medical school at Cornell University, as a matter oh, of fact. So that, that was my goal. And I was working with horses as a horseback riding instructor. And it was a muddy day. And I was uh, practicing jumping. And I had a very, very bad fall off a horse. The horse fell on me. The fence fell on me. It was a mess. And anyway, they hauled me out of there. It was muddy. It was raining. And my father had to leave work to come and get me. And, you know, my mother, they were nervous wrecks. Anyway, it turned out that I really had to be wheelchair bound after that. And then when we went to the surgeon, they said, well, you have such a severe back injury that you really will never be able to walk again without surgery. But then I will say I had a spiritual revelation. I actually heard voices that told me that's not true. There's many things that you can do to help yourself. And I was, you know, young. So I went to the local library and some of our listeners, including perhaps you, Dr. Gittleman would remember, there was such a thing as called a card catalog. Mm. And we had little cards. (laughs) There was no computer. There were no cell phones. There were no credit cards. It's a while ago. And (laughs) in those drawers, that's how people look stuff up in the library, which by the way, I loved that system. Um, So I looked up, you know, I looked up back injury and lo and behold, I found so many things. For instance, Bernard Jensen had already written books about natural therapeutics for a back injury. And then Edgar Cayce, 
interesting medical psychic. There's an entire library of his remedies, which are extremely effective in um, Virginia Beach. So I found out that he had all these remedies using a castor oil pack, using calcium, using an herb called horsetail grass, which I later found out is very high in silica, mm. um, using white willow bark, which now has all these evidence-based evidence studies showing that it's extremely effective for lower back pain. And I started using all those things. How did I get them? Well, my dad, God bless him, was a big help as he always was his whole life to me. And he actually wrote checks, you know, because I didn't have a checkbook yet. I was young and there was no credit cards and there was no ordering online. There was no right, online. Right. So we would call these places and mail a check for castor oil pack, for calcium, for horsetail grass, and um, other anti-inflammatory herbs like white willow bark. And then I use them. As I use them, I felt myself get better and better. So I wrote it all down and documented it. And the next time I went back to the surgeon, which was supposed to be the day I got wheeled in a wheelchair there to schedule surgery, I got right out of that car and walked in the doctor's office. Miracle of miracles. Yeah. So that's what he said. So first of all, I thought he would be very pleased. Well, he wasn't pleased at all because what came walking into his office was one less surgery he's going to do, right? Mm. But he was actually upset, which blew me away. I walked in there with my beautiful list of remedies, each of which had helped me. Homeopathics also. Thinking, thinking, he, thinking he'd be very excited and want yes. to know more. Yes, thinking he would want to know so he could use this on all his prospective surgery patients. Well, no such thing occurred. He moved his glasses way down to the tip of his nose, held that protocol paper as far away from him as, as, as he could, like, boy, this thing really smells, and said, well, this is just a bunch of old wives' tales. I said, but doctor, did you see I walked in? He said, well, sometimes there's what, what's the word they always placebo use? Placebo effect. The placebo effect, or they say spontaneous remission, mm. which means you get better and they don't know why, mm. you know, which happens. I said, I don't think so, doctor, because each of these things, as I use them, I felt a change and now I walked in your office. Okay, well, that he wasn't happy about, but nonetheless, I left feeling very inspired. I said, if these are old wives' tales, then I am looking into them. And that's what I have done the rest of my life, which is searched out traditional remedies in many of my books, such as The Natural Medicine Chest and The Great Guide to Great Sex and Arthritis, The Alternative Medicine Definitive Guide. I have 16 books that I wrote. In oh all of them, I travel to live with indigenous healers in different areas of the world. And I documented what they used for thousands of years traditionally, sometimes passed down only through oral tradition, sometimes written as in traditional Chinese medicine and in Ayurvedic medicine. They have some things that are written. An ancient Jewish code medicine, mm. um, such as various rabbis that used all these natural therapeutics. So I delved into those. And then I got grants and, and got advanced degrees in nursing. I'm a PhD nurse. And I started taking these old remedies to mainstream medical laboratories, where many of times we got funding to actually look into the mechanisms of action, not if these things work, because we clearly knew they did, or the information would not get passed down, but how and why they worked. How so? Now, this is fascinating to me. I want to go back to something you mentioned kind of cursful, cursory, in a cursory manner, and that was the castor oil packs. Could you explain to my listeners what that is all about? I'd be because happy that, that was a primary remedy that Edgar Casey talked about for many, many years. And traditionally, it was used over the gallbladder and liver. But you used it as an anti-inflammatory mechanism? Well, you know, it can be used in many ways. And over the gallbladder and liver is an excellent way and also over the kidneys. So people can find out how to actually use one just by going to my website, naturalnurse.com and search 
castor oil pack because I have full and complete and easy to follow instructions in how to do it. And it's also super inexpensive. I mean, we're talking about, you know, a $12, $20 investment that could last for five years before you run out of castor oil. <laughs> and so you use either a heating pad or I prefer a hot water bottle because I don't like the electromagnetic field in a heating pad. Right. And then, you know, I'm not going to explain all the details about how to do it, but people can look there. Basically, it's external. What's really nice about that is not too much worry with herb drug interactions. And I'm not saying don't use herbs because of that, but when you're going to take herbs, if you're already on conventional pharmaceuticals, you need to know what would the interaction be there before you just take it, because people do get in trouble with that, using natural remedies on their own without any guidance. But using that externally, you don't have to be too worried about it. And yes, it's great on joints. I write about using it in my book, Arthritis arthritis externally on joints and even with ginger along with the castor oil. Oh, I didn't even realize that. So wasn't it called the Pama Christe, the, the hand of Christ by Edgar Casey? Yes, because that is, is, if you look at the leaf of that plant, it's a beautiful, big, tall plant. In fact, here in Oyster Bay, people actually have uh, where they try to grow the tallest one because it grows very, very tall, mostly in the tropics, but it can also be grown just in the summer oh. um, in the East Coast. So it's called Palma Christi. If anybody looks at the picture of the plant, you will see that the hand uh, it really looks like the palm of a hand, the leaves. But oh. interestingly enough, when you're growing castor oil, the um, seeds of the castor, the little fruit that grows on there can be very, very toxic. In fact, it produces a, a really intense poison called ricin. So that can kill people, literally. So you need to know how to extract the oil out the correct way before it's used. But if you buy castor oil, that has already been done. You know, there's a remedy that they use for candida and fungus, which has an, a, some sort of castor oil properties to it. I think it's called erucic acid. It's yep. put out by Thorne, and I know it's worked remedies for can wonders for candida. So I'm wondering what the internal effects would be of right. the copper oil. Well, you know, there's actually studies in terms of using castor oil internally to aid with um, giving birth. Mm -hmm. You know, but you do want to work with a professional for that. But it does because it's a lubricant and it, it's somewhat of a laxative and it's actually um, used. I delivered over 200 babies at home oh, in the my 1970s. Goodness. My first one was born in 1975. I said to him just the other day, how dare you be 46? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that can't possibly be true. Wasn't it yesterday that I just had you? No, I guess not. <laughs> but that's how it seems, I'm sure, to many of you uh, elders here on our call today, life goes fast. But I was delivering many babies at home in those years at our off the grid farm where my children were born, which was in Bisbee, Arizona. Oh, my God, you've got quite a history. But you know, I want to move into another area. We're in the midst of a pandemic. So tell me what you know about the uh, the antiviral properties of certain nerves. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so is there it, real literature to talk real, about the evidence? Real. There is so much, it's unbelievable. And you know what, although for reasons, you know, we could, we could dispute the reasons and we don't wanna be that political, but why this stuff? This should be on the nightly news every night if they want to, you know, if people would like to take a vaccine, that's your choice in terms of mandating that. I can't tell you how against that I am, but nonetheless, why don't they even talk about these studies in mainstream literature. Oh, I'll right. read you just a couple. Whoa. We have documented studies about vitamin A, about yeah. vitamin D, about vitamin C, about zinc, selenium, NAC, which is called N-acetylcysteine, mm. just to name a few. And then the herbs, oil of oregano, um, black seed, which is called nigella sentiva, um, olive leaf. These have so much documentation and it's not hidden by the way yet. 
It has not been taken down these studies yet. And I say yet with great trepidation, but I suggest all of you listeners go to PubMed, which is actually run by the government. It's just where all the studies are and look this stuff up. For instance, here's one, robust T-cell immunity in convalescent individuals with asymptomatic or mild COVID-19, mm. about COVID-19. And this is specifically about vitamin C. Mm. So there's so much there. There, there's so many studies. Another one, the emerging role of vitamin C in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Mm. This is in Nutrient Magazine, October 2020. This is totally new. Overview of the possible role of vitamin C in management of COVID-19. This is in Pharmacological Research Journal, 2020. And there's so many now in 2021, even more. So why isn't this being super duper promoted? In fact, they should be, they, if they want to give away vaccines, that's okay with me. But why don't they give away vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc? Yes. It's so cheap. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. What about elderberry, my dear? What, what are your thoughts about elderberry? So elderberry is amazing because elderberry has a very specific mechanism of action. Mm. And what that does is it stops viruses from being able to duplicate. And here is a meta-analysis randomized control trial about black elderberry, which is Sambucus nigra, supplementation effectively treats upper respiratory symptoms in COVID. I mean, this is specifically studied. So everyone should have elderberry in their natural medicine chest. Now, during this COVID time, um, some doctors thought that since elderberry so actively uh, stops the ability of viruses to duplicate, that they thought it might be linked to something that is called a cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. And a cytokine storm is when the immune system gets overactivated and may go after your own cell structures instead of just the virus. And while that is as of now not fully proven, it's a consideration. So I would use black elderberry, particularly Sambucus nigra, also called Sambucus as a product. I would use that. I would have it in your house. I would have it in your purse. I would have it in your car. And the time to use it along with the vitamin C and zinc and zinc and vitamin D and oil of oregano and olive leaf and oxalococcinum, all of these things. And aspirin, by the way, you want those in a little kit. And if you think you're coming down with the very first signs of any cold or flu, before you even know if it's COVID or not, just go ahead and start slam dunking that stuff. I mean, you know, four to six times a day. Now, the only time that that cytokine storm might be an issue, which actually there's no verification that it ever has been, is if there's no verification that the elderberry has caused it, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. it, certainly, it certainly does occur in people with advanced COVID. Right. So that's not the time to start taking this. This is a, a like before and beginning stages that we want to use lots of these natural remedies. So we hear a lot these days, my old good friend and not so old, but my new old friend, we hear these days about EBV. There's a lot of interest about the Epstein-Barr virus. Would you say that some of the anti-COVID natural antivirals are good for EBV? Oh, absolutely. And I've been using them in my clinical practice for more than 50 years for EBV. Because, you know, Epstein-Barr, which is, of course, something that is very, let's say, annoying as well as not fun to have because it sticks around so long. And, and sort of like Lyme disease, it can exacerbate and retreat. So even when you think you don't have it anymore, it might come back later. Then we might use more ongoing, a little bit more aggressive therapies like we did with Dr. Serafina Corsello. She had a oh, fabulous a clinic. Heart. Yes. And I was her head nurse for 23 years. No, I did. Why didn't I know that? And explain to her, everybody what, who Dr. Corsello was. Well, Dr. Serafina Corsello had a fabulous holistic fabulous. clinic. In New York, wasn't it in New York? We itself? had two centers. One was in Huntington, Long Island 
Island and one was on the corner of 57th and 7th, very oh, fancy no. office. Not and the far from Dr. Atkins. No, Dr. Atkins was right there too, because I worked for him also. I taught his, uh, all his staff how to use a dark field microscope. So also we were very involved with setting up a camp. Yes. And, you know, so I was, you know, one of the real originals with that whole One, one of the pioneers, my dear. Uh, you know, not really. I, I don't oh, say yes, that. You, you were. Well, thank you. But don't forget, we were learning from others, right? We were learning from Dr. Leo Galland, who set up the parasite investigation with stool testing. Well, we've interviewed we, my friends on a previous podcast. He's terrific. He's fantastic. So, so this was an exciting time because we had this huge complimentary medical practice in New York, right next to Carnegie Hall. The reason it was there is Dr. Corsello was, you know, if she hadn't been a doctor, she would have been an opera singer. And I <laughs> loved her dearly. She was one of my dear friends. And she always opera sang at every party we had. And oh my God gosh. bless that she got a medical degree. That's all I'll say. Because she was a fabulous, fabulous. What doctor. happened to her, Ellen? Yeah, so that's a sad story. And it has to do with even looking at the politics of the current times. So she was extremely vocal about the fact that she used natural remedies. She got people off their pharmaceuticals and was fabulously successful at it. Yes. And we had thousands of patients. And, and what not, this was in the 80s and 90s? Yeah. And not, yes. And not only did she have that clinic in New York, we also had a very, very big clinic in Huntington, Long Island. And I mostly worked there as well as going to New York, she'd have to pay me a lot. I always told her to go to New York. So I only went once a month and she did, uh, you know, cover my, me handsomely for that visit. But nonetheless, in Huntington, Long Island, we had another very large center. So what, what she did was really treat people naturally and, got, and they got better. So, and we documented it with blood work, and chart reviews, and we did a lot of research. So what happened was the Office of Professional Medical Contact did not like that, just like they don't like anybody telling you now about natural remedies for COVID. It's yes. gotten worse, not better. Much worse. And they came in and they took her license for absolutely no reason. Oh. What they said it was for was for too much testing. Because oh my gosh. What she did is she would test not only the usual blood work, but she would test. And then, you know, sometimes, and a lot of people have this, they come in for regular blood work and they're told everything's fine. But they're but not fine. Not, they no, may have Epstein not. Barr, right? They may have Epstein Barr. So we would do a viral scan. We would do a heavy metal analysis. We would look for, um, plastics, which we know now how toxic they are. We would do special tests in the blood. We would use Leo Gallon's discovery in terms of looking for parasites in stool samples. Yeah. So we went, we did do much more testing. We would analyze every person for all their nutrient levels, which I really do believe should be part of it, mainstream medicine. I totally agree. Because you could find out someone has a low vitamin B level. They don't need another antidepressant med, they just need some B vitamins, which is a whole lot cheaper and safer for them. So be that as it may, that's why they took her license, because oh. they claimed she was doing too much testing. Oh, my goodness. Right. But never one person claimed. And at her review hearing, we had 400 of her patients show up trying to fight it. They wouldn't even let them in the building. Oh, I know she was a uh, compadre of Dr. Atkins back in, in the day. I think oh, yeah. And, and Robert Hoffman, who I just was on his show recently. Yep. A uh, lot of holistic uh, doctors. at that All time. of our friends. So as we move into the COVID issue, is there anything else people should do that are anti, that is particularly antiviral? Because well, that's, I'll tell a, you that's on thing. everybody's mind. Yeah, there's a lot of antivirals. I actually am a supporter of wearing a mask. I think it doesn't hurt. And as a nurse being in and out of lots of surgery over the years, I think it definitely does cut down physically on the transmission of viruses. But in terms of herbs, what you want to have in your natural medicine chest is oxalococcinum. That's actually a homeopathic, not an herb. Oil of oregano, olive leaf, colloidal silver, and then the ones that we talked about like vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and selenium. And vitamin and I, A, the anti-infection. Vitamin A is excellent. And quercetin. Just go on PubMed and look up quercetin. There's 
fabulous new studies, and Dr. Michael Murray has written in depth about it as well, that quercetin is actually not only antiviral, but specifically for COVID. Most of these remedies have been tested specifically on COVID. So has andrographis and echinacea and golden seal, um, in general, golden seal and berberine, which is the active constituent. So I actually have a little teeny suitcase where I have all of those. Now, I don't just take them all every day, but if I travel, which I have been going back to traveling a little bit, even in my car, if I'm out for the day and should get the slightest bit of scratchy throat or, or in an airplane, because I do live in several areas around the country, I have that stuff with me at the first sign like you can take all of that, you know, maybe once every few days, but then at the first sign of any kind of infection, you can ram those milligram amounts up and keep that up. And you know what? I have over 150 people I personally had who were, who did test positive for COVID, used this protocol and were able to just basically have a few days of not feeling so great. Which, which of course, news. yeah, which happens anyway, that happens at anyway, we, we haven't done a double blind to say it's because of this, yet each of them has so many studies, like you talked about candida, you know, looking at mono Lauren, that's another great one to help get rid of these microbes. Oh, so yes. there's, there's definitely help. What I don't like is why isn't this on the news every day? Why? Well, that, that, that's, the, that's a topic for another podcast. You're family. right. You're right. A whole other podcast. But you, you offer something that I'm very impressed with. And I didn't know it until I read your CV. You actually have a class. It's a course where you get a certain amount of CEUs called the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Course. How many CEUs are this? Yeah, this so I, I teach every single day and all of my classes offer CEUs. Many of the individual classes, like I did one yesterday specifically on herbs for the lungs and respiratory system that offers three CEUs. Now, even if somebody doesn't take it at that time, they're all available on demand. So someone just has to go to naturalnurse.com and email me and I'll send you to where you could take any of them. But the one you're talking about is called the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Course. Is that and on naturalnurse.com? Yes, you can find it there. And that is not just recorded. That we do in real time live. And there is a lot of homework. And it is 18 CEUs. And those are oh, for 18. R 18. For and RNs. that's for RNs, NPs, and licensed LMTs. massage ther therapists, RDs. RDs right? Uh, clinical nutritionists, a whole range. Now, if you don't have any of those degrees, but you just want to learn how to use herbs for yourself or your family, or even work on becoming a registered herbalist, you do not need a medical degree, although you need 1600 hours of study. So this course can be taken by anyone. But if you have one of those degrees, you can then get 18 CEUs for taking it. Wonderful news. And so what would your parting words be about the importance of antiviral herbs? Well, I think everyone should learn them. You can learn them any kind of way. Uh, easy. Uh, you can go to my website. You can go to Anne Louise Gittleman's website. You can go to PubMed if you want just the government information about the studies of all these active natural ingredients. It's all right there. It's right there. It's maddening that they don't discuss it on every single news show every day because these studies are from 2020 and 2021. And so I would suggest you educate yourself, you prepare yourself by getting these natural remedies at your house, by the way. Millions of people have, you know, the nutraceutical industry. Um, and Louise grew 17.8% in one year. Oh, my God. Why is that? Because people are waking up. They're searching for this information on their own because all they're being told is just take a vaccine. And then every day we speak to people who took the vaccine and they're in the hospital dying. So, you know, not to not take it. You want to take it, do what you want. But there's really you need to do You've got more. alternatives. You want the choices and you want informed consent is what you want. Exactly. So I want to thank you for being my guest today, Ellen Kamai. What is up for you next, my dear? Well, uh, I never know, you know, <laughs> what my, my prayer, I pray a lot, I meditate a lot, I do yoga every day, I eat all organic food, 
and I walk three miles a day and I in my states of meditation I've I'm so old now that I don't feel I need to make a decision about what I'm supposed to do next. You'll be so loved. I say, I say to God, lead me where you need me and use me for the highest good. And that is really my only plan. What a lovely note. That's just lovely. So on that note, we're going to say goodbye to all my dear friends, fans, and family that are listening to First Lady of Nutrition podcast. This is Anne Louise Gittleman inviting you to listen in yet once again where we will be having the nutritional greats, the highlights of the nutritional field and the natural healing arena and have a wonderful week where you're safe, where you're sound, where you're healthy and where you're happy. Shalom, shalom. everybody. I'm Ann Louise here with just one more thing. Thank you so much for being a fan of my work. And if you like this video, please check out all my other videos. Please subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications.